When you look at that chart, this is what we are going to cover concerning inference to the best explanation. Now, for some of you who don't recall about the inference to the best explanation, inference to the best explanation, remember, is the number one tool that you want to use to prove your Christian faith. This is actually a scientific empirical tool. A lot of people, they won't listen to you because they'll say, well, you don't have scientific proof. Well, there is no scientific proof. You can even argue logically, you can argue rationally, but they still won't believe you because it's not scientifically tested. Remember, science is their god. Empiricism is based off of science. Basically, what we experience through our five senses, taste, feel, touch, our physical senses, those things must be true. That's empirical, scientific beliefs that is pervasive in our world. I've argued that for the existence of God, it is scientifically proven. It is empirically proven. Now, not proven in the sense where it's 100% factual because there could be possibilities around it. But whenever I say the word proof or proven, it is based as much as any other scientific theory. Remember that. People say the law of gravity. That one is a truth to them, or they'll talk about evolutionary theory. But these people, they they will admit it's not 100% truth or proof. The reason why is because hypothesis can change in time. There could be things about our physical universe, things in our experience that could change in time. There are also things that we actually do not see from the past. So we have to find the best guesswork to trace what actually happened in the past through our everyday experience of our physical five senses, okay? So the God hypothesis, meaning we have a scientific hypothesis about the existence of God, that is as much proof and truth as any other scientific theory, such as evolutionary theory to the liberals or the law of gravity to our modern scientific world. Now, I'm not saying that I believe in evolution, Big Bang, or anything like that, but what I'm trying to argue to you that you can argue to the world is that any hypothesis that the scientific community uses, they just take it face value unconsciously. Liberals take it unconsciously as truth, as fact. So I want to argue that the God hypothesis is as much weight for that kind of fact or truth to them. Now I use that arbitrarily, fact and truth, just like any scientific theory that could be abstract, where they deem it as truth or fact, but they know that it's not 100% certainty, okay? So that's the best way you can argue for your Christian faith. So don't dogmatically say that it's 100% fact or 100% truth or 100% proof. If you do it that way, then they'll argue possibilities around it. So I'm going to explain that part. We're going to go by abductive inferences. Abductive inferences is your safest card to use to prove your God hypothesis. The abductive inferences, they come down to inference to the best explanation. So inference to the explanation will cover abductive inferences. And what we covered in our last discipleship class is Bayesian probability calculus. All of these two branches are what we're covering through inference to the best explanation. And remember, this is a scientific tool. All these three are mathematical, scientific, empirical tools to use. Remember that. 
This is nothing Christian. This is not even just something logical or rational. This is scientific. This is covered in philosophy and science. So remember these terms, and then they will be extremely helpful. Now, I'm going to cover uh, inference to the best explanation and abductive inferences and how that works. What we're going to do, this is where we're going to cover and debunk. So what created our universe? Why do we believe God exists? Because when we think about our existence, how this physical universe existed, these are the only five that you can think of. These are the only five that they'll argue against. Now, everyone trumps materialism. That's what everyone's going for. Uh, let's see right here. I forgot how to write. Was it like this? Or was it like this? Oh, well, I forgot how to write. Anyway, so with materialism, is it this guy? No, was it this guy? No, I forgot. All right, whatever. What's that? I was right. Ah, oh, now I can write. Okay, it's, I click this guy. Okay, thank you. Materialism is the one that everybody goes for. And materialism, they argue everything in our physical universe, universe existed by itself. That's what they're trying to argue, right? So the two keys are chance. So you just give it time and randomness, and then it will, crea it will create or evolve into something. And then also necessity. In other words, because of how these things are made or how these things are, these materials, these elements, they have to evolve. They, if they work or operate or they collide with each other, it'll produce into something more complicated or evolve into a bigger complicated element. Does that make sense to all of you? So that's what they believe. It's either by necessity or chance, or both together, which they use. Now, this is going to be debunked, and then pantheism, panspermia, and deism will also be debunked, and will prove that theism is the best explanation. That's what we're going to find out. Now, when we go back to our whiteboard, let's see, it's not, it's not what just happened there. All right. Let's go back. It's called getting used to. All right. So inference to the best explanation. It's going to be explained as follows. Let me turn to the page here, and then I'm going to cover a lot of reading pages, explaining inference to the best explanation through abductive inferences. Mm, let's see here. There's a lot of reading material here. Just trying to find that right page number. Okay, here we are. All right. This is how it works. I'm going to be reading to you page 224 of the God Hypothesis. This is from Dr. Stephen Meyer from Cambridge. So he, he showed these three tools scientific tools that we can use. This is something I didn't make up. This is something that scientists and philosophers uh, who, who major in science also can affirm to be true. They have things here called deductive schema and abductive schema. Deductive schema is, a, is not an effective tool that you should use. Now, there are people who are philosophers who argue for the existence of God. When you look at their debates, Probably one of the famous ones is William Lane Craig. He uses deductive schema or some elements of deductive schema. He doesn't entirely use the abductive schema method here, which is why some of the atheists might give him a hard time. So what, we're, what I'm showing you here is a more stronger tool then perhaps one of the best champions against atheism, William Lane Craig's tool, I'm showing you a better tool than his. So this one is something that uh, Dr. Meyer pulled up, which is extremely safe for you to use because it is open to possibilities that atheists might use to argue around it. But 
this type of schema, abductive schema, is based on what scientists actually use to test their experiments and to come up with their hypotheses. So this is much more safe and stronger than the deductive schema. Why is that? Because, according to Dr. Meyer, the logic of abduction, however, does not produce certainty, but instead pl plausibility or possibility. Unlike deduction, okay, what's the problem with deduction? In which the data or minor premise affirms the antecedent variable, abductive logic affirms the consequent variable. In deductive logic, affirming the consequent variable with certainty constitutes a fallacy. One that derives from the failure to acknowledge that more than one antecedent might explain or generate the same evidence. Let's keep reading here. To see why, consider the following argument. If it rains, the streets will get wet. The streets are wet. Therefore, it rained. Or symbolically, if R, then W, W. Therefore, R. Obviously, this argument has a problem. Why? It does not follow that because the streets are wet, it necessarily rained. The streets may have gotten wet in some other way. A fire hydrant may have burst, or a snowbank may have melted. Nevertheless, that the streets are wet might indicate that it has rained. Thus, amending the argument as follows avoids the fallacy. Okay, so what's he talking about? What's he talking about is something where we Bible believers have actually used deductive schemas. So we did the same thing as well. The, if you recall from your other discipleship lessons that you did with me, we try to argue the possibilities for how we existed or how our universe existed. And there were only four possibilities, right? One is supernatural. Two is that it just naturally happened. Three, it just uh, came out of purely nothing. Or that four, uh, the fourth thing is it's an illusion. Now, we crossed out the other ones and came to supernatural, right? And that's how we argued for the existence of God. I've done that many times, and it was very easy to argue against atheists and to prove the existence of God to any common knowledge person. But this one is advanced discipleship we're studying. So when you cover people with advanced degrees especially when they major in science, that's not going to work with them, okay? They're not going to say, well, you can't just argue it supernaturally happened because there could be alternative possibilities we just don't know yet. See that? We're insisting, no, there's only four possibilities. Tell me if there's any other possibility. There's none. There's only four. That is dogmatic to them. They're saying, well, you assume there's only four. How do you not know there are other possibilities? We might say, well, then you tell me. And they're going to say, we don't, I can't tell you because we don't know yet. See, that's how atheist agnostics always get around these arguments. So which, which shows a sign of weakness, you notice, right? Because they, they just keep finding ways to slide their way around. So Dr. Meyer argues this. Instead of a deductive schema, abductive is much more powerful. Why is that? Abductive is open to possible alternative explanations. Other possibilities we don't know yet. But he's going to show you it's, it's not reasonable to just say, well, we don't know what the other possibilities are, so we just can't conclude that it's all done supernaturally. That's the only alternative. Actually, you do have to. Even though that there are other possible explanations to the existence of our universe, the point is we don't know yet. And because we don't know yet, it's not a scientific thing to do to just say, to throw up your hands and say, well, we can't do anything about it. No, with any physical substance or element you're studying, you have to look at your, the possibilities that you do know and pick the best one. That's what you're supposed to do. So abductive, that's abductive schema. That's what scientists do with any experiment, with any element they study. 
So when they study certain elements or physical things in our universe, they have to come up with the same thing like we did, right? How did our universe exist? How did this physical thing come to be? Then they have to think about what are the possibilities. So let's take the existence of our universe. There's only four. It's done supernaturally. It's done naturally by itself. It purely came from nothing or it's an illusion. Those are the only four things that uh, concerning about the ori origin of our universe. Those are the only four things. So then I have to pick the best one as the explanation. To us Bible believers, we choose supernatural, right? Yeah. Now remember, atheists, why are they going to argue? You can't just pick supernatural because how do you not know there are other possibilities you don't know about? The scientist who is experimenting with that physical thing is not going to conclude like that. The scientist will still pick that best one and go off of that for his hypothesis until you come up with the other possibility that can explain it away, which you haven't yet. See that? That's how we got our technology, our advancement in science. Why? We pick the best possible explanation. And piggybacking off of that, we came up with our hypothesis, our experiment, and then later on our technology and our scientific theories based off of the best possible explanation. That's how we've always done it. That's why scientists, you understand why they call the, those things theories? They call it scientific theories not because it's just guesswork. Yes, it is guesswork, but the reason why they call it theory is because there could be other possible explanations out there we don't know yet. But until you can come up with one, you can't just dismiss the scientific theory. Right. Same thing with this one. Because of this scientific hypothesis that God is the best explanation, you can't just dismiss it as, well, there could be other possible explanations out there. No, until you come up with one, then you can dismiss the God hypothesis. But until then, don't dismiss this scientific hypothesis, this scientific theory, until you come up with a better explanation. All right, do we all follow so far? That's how inference to the best explanation works, okay? Based off of abductive schema, not deductive schema. All right, so we follow so far. All right, so here we go. Symbolically is what? If rain, then wet. Next part, wet. Perhaps rain. See, that, see the wording there? Not that it is rain, but perhaps. Why? Because there could be a other possible explanation out there how the streets got wet we don't know about. But until then, the most logical, the best explanation is that it was raining. That's why the streets are wet. All right, as the above shows, even if one may not affirm the consequent with certainty, one may affirm it as a possibility. And this is precisely what abductive reasoning does. It does provide a reason for considering that a hypothesis might be true. Indeed, it gives a reason for believing a hypothesis, even if one cannot affirm the hypothesis or conclusion with certainty. Notice also the role our expectations play in this reasoning. That's important, what we expect. See that? That has to do with empiricism. Our everyday experience, what our physical senses experience, what we would expect, what we would guess. The major premises in abductive inferences typically depend upon our expectations of what ought to follow from some previous state of affairs. Thus, Pierce would often articulate the major premise in an abductive inference by describing how, given some antecedent A, some consequence C would, full, would follow as a matter of course. Nevertheless, he might just as well have said that given some antecedent A, we should expect C to follow as a matter of course. So even though it's a possibility, even though it's something we can't say it's 100% fact, it's something that should naturally follow. It should naturally follow. It's something you ought to expect. So in other words, it should happen from what you experience. So that means it's still very strong argument. It doesn't make it weak. If you want to argue it's weak, then you have to do the same thing with natural selection. 
You have to do it with evolutionary theories because all of them are uh, based on abductive schemas. Same thing like what we're pulling up right here. All right. Both the natural and historical sciences employ such logic routinely. Told you so. In the natural sciences, if we have reason to expect that some state of affairs will ensue given the truth of some hypothesis, and we find that such a state of affairs has occurred, then we say that our hypothesis has been confirmed. This method of confirmation of hypothesis functions to provide evidential support for many scientific hypotheses, though, again, obviously not proof. He gives an example. Given Copernicus's heliocentric theory of the solar system, astronomers in the 17th century had reason to expect that the planet Venus should exhibit phases. Galileo's discovery that Venus does exhibit phases therefore supported the heliocentric view. The discovery did not prove the heliocentric theory However, since other theories might, and in fact could, explain the same fact. Let's keep reading. Pierce acknowledged that abductive inferences on their own may constitute a rather weak form of evidential support. He noted, as a general rule, abduction is a weak kind of argument. It often inclines our judgment so slightly towards its conclusion that we cannot say that we believe the latter to be true. We only surmise that it may be so. Yet, as a practical matter, practically speaking, real-life scenarios that we use, Pierce acknowledged that abduction often yields conclusions that are difficult to doubt even if they lack uh, the airtight certainty that accompanies the logic of deduction. Here's, a, here's an easy example. For instance, Pierce argued that skepticism about the existence of Napoleon Bonaparte was unjustified, even though Napoleon's existence could be known only by abduction. You might say, really? Isn't it 100% fact, 100% truth? No, you could be wrong. How do you not know there's a conspiracy? How do you not know that there's a possible alternative explanation out there? I mean, you never saw Napoleon. You never touched or experimented with him, right? So why do we believe he still exists, though, even though we can't prove it 100% fact? Because it's only known by abduction. What is abduction? The idea is this. As Pierce put it, numberless documents refer to a conqueror called Napoleon Bonaparte. Though we have not seen the man, yet we cannot explain what we have seen, namely all these documents and monuments, without supposing that he really existed. Thus, Pierce suggested that by comparing the explanatory power of a hypothesis against other competing hypotheses, Historians or scientists can often strengthen particular abductive inferences, rendering them for all practical purposes beyond reasonable doubt. So it's still considered to be beyond reasonable doubt, even if it's not 100% factual. Why? Because in real life scenarios, scientists are not going to just go by, I need something 100% factual. They cannot do that. What they have to do is, given the evidences that they see, you notice that right there? It confirms their hypothesis. It confirms their theory. By doing that, they can't just dismiss the hypothesis. They can't dismiss the theory. Well, what if their theory, their hypothesis is wrong? That's why you have to compare that with other competing hypotheses or theories and find which one is still the best. Given what you see, given the evidences, so to speak, given what you experience. All right, does this make a little bit more sense? All right, so now we're going to strengthen the abductive inference. Let's look at uh, page 228. This method of inferring to the best explanation has several advantages over either deduction or simple abduction. Why is that? Deductive inferences produce certainty, but only if the premises are known to be true. Yet major premises in deductive arguments typically affirm universal statements or generalizations about the world that depend upon some prior inductive inference that may itself be uncertain. Thus, the standard of deductive certainty may be hard to meet. 
On the other hand, abductive inference either provide weak epistemic support for a merely possible conclusion or if their conclusions are affirmed with certainty, commit the fallacy of affirming the consequent. If Miss Jones had jumped straight from wet driveway and car to rain, she would have been guilty of affirming the consequent, referred to more colloquially as jumping to conclusions, unless abductive inferences are strengthened, unless, see that? Unless abductive inferences are strengthened using a what? Process of elimination showing various alternative hypotheses, hypotheses to be implausible, they will remain inconclusive. But by systematically evaluating the explanatory power of competing hypotheses, and by eliminating those that lack causal adequacy or plausibility, given our background knowledge, Alternative hypotheses can often be eliminated, sometimes leaving only one plausible explanation. In such cases, the method of inference to the best explanation can help scientists arrive at a definite, if not absolutely, certain conclusion. Okay, so what's the idea here? The idea here is this. So inferences uh, to the best explanation, uh, let's see right here. It could, be weak, uh, it could be weak based on abductive inference. Remember that. It can be weak, and deductive is a lot more strong, but the problem with deductive is it's a statement like matter-of-fact truth, right? Given the premises are 100% matter-of-fact truth, we don't know if even the premises could be 100% matter-of-fact truth. We saw the premises, right? Uh, back to our example. What's the origin? that created our universe. Illusion came from nothing, supernaturally happened, naturally happened, right? We mentioned that before? Okay, but remember these premises, we can't just say 100% matter of fact true, no one was there at the very beginning, so we can't pull it up. But the abductive inference becomes powerful, why? One, because of process of elimination, but remember he mentioned that's not the only thing. The power is built up, the explanatory power is built up even more and more and more based off of eliminating other possibilities, right? So we did that. It doesn't make sense it came from purely nothing. It doesn't make sense that, uh, excuse me, that it came from purely nothing, that uh, the universe always existed and it just happened naturally by itself. Third, an illusion, no one will go for that one. So the best thing is it's supernatural, something outside of the natural realm that just put it into there. So we did that, but that's not the only thing. But the second thing is things that confirm your hypothesis. So like the one with Napoleon Bonaparte, right? We have to look at evidences or things that we do know that can confirm that what? That there's an intelligent designer to all of this. That's why it's supernatural. Now, I'll explain more of that later as we cover this soon. But that's ex explanation to building up the power of inference to the best explanation. We follow so far? Okay. So I'm translating it to basic English for those of you who got bored and got lost in all this. Now this is extremely important. As a, uh, this is page 230. As a philosopher of science, Michael Scriven explained in his description of inference to the best explanation, or what he called retrospective causal analysis, when historical scientists lack previous direct experience of a cause actual efficacy in producing an effect of the type in question, there might be theoretical grounds for thinking it a possible cause. Why? Other historians and philosophers of science have explained that extrapolation from the known causal powers of a uh, relevantly similar cause might also play a role in justifying such a postulated cause. Okay, the, the point is this. We never saw uh, the, the hot plasma uh, of that... 
uh, immense, uh, that infinitely dense concentration of matter that produced the Big Bang. Okay? Neither God, neither the existence of God. But why is it that it's still logical or even scientific to conclude that it's either God or an infinitely hot, uh, hot density of matter? Why is it that scientists can still do that? The reason why is because of extrapolation. We can extrapolate from things we experience in our everyday life that has done the same things. So, for example, in our everyday experience, if we see a watch, if we see a building, even though we never saw those creators, we know from common everyday experience that people created those things. So through such experiences with these examples, we can extrapolate it to the same thing with an intelligent designer God. Does that make sense? But think about it when you do use that extrapolation with the universe naturally happen by itself. That's a lot smaller, isn't it? The chances of that. That's why it still stands intelligent design is the best possible explanation. Okay, we follow so far, right? Now, I'm not denying things can naturally happen by itself, but what you're going to find out when we compete those two hypotheses against each other, intelligent design is the best. So let's explain through this example. Indeed, scientists sometimes invoke <coughs> theoretical considerations to assess causal adequacy. The Big Bang Theory postulated an initial infinitely hot, dense concentration of all matter and energy at the beginning of the universe. Clearly, no one had ever directly observed an infinitely hot, dense concentration of matter producing some definite effect. So then why is it still scientific for them to do that? The reason why is, nevertheless, physicists understood something about the attributes of black bodies. Recall that black bodies are idealized objects that would perfectly absorb electromagnetic radiation and re-emit radiation in specific spectral signatures. Having theoretical reasons for thinking that a near-perfect black body would have existed soon after the beginning of the universe, scientists then deduced what they would expect to observe if such a hot, dense state had existed. Let's keep reading right here. Uh, by using their theoretically derived knowledge of the spectral emission signatures of black bodies and calculating how the wavelengths of light would stretch out as space expanded after the expanded after the universe cooled from its initial plasma state, physicists predicted that an infinitely hot, dense concentration of matter at the beginning of the universe would eventually produce cosmic background radiation at a specific black body temperature with a specific spectral signature. Since the steady state model did not postulate such an initial dense concentration of mass energy, steady state proponents did not expect to observe a pervasive background radiation. Thus, the two different postulations about the past and theoretical reasoning about near-perfect black bodies and their postulated properties allow scientists to generate two different sets of expectations about what ought to be observed in the universe today. Those different expectations allow cosmologists, upon observing the emission signature of the cosmic background radiation, to decide which of the two cosmological models better explain the evidence of observational astronomy. Darwin used a similar strategy to establish, at least initially, the causal adequacy of his mechanism of random variation and natural selection. By drawing an analogy between artificial and natural selection, he suggested that natural selection could produce morphological change in organisms just as artificial selection could. Darwin then invoked the theoretical consideration that natural selection would have had more time to operate. Next, he extrapolated, extrapolated from the observed causal powers of artificial selection operating over a relatively short time to justify the claim that natural selection operating over a much longer stretch could produce much greater morphological change. Though biologists cannot directly observe natural selection producing the amount of change Darwin postulated, his extrapolation provided a theoretical justification for concluding that natural selection could cause significant morphological innovation. Okay, what's the bottom line right here, okay, with blah, 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 blah. The point is, cosmologists who study the universe, to how our universe existed, and Darwin, when he came up with his evolutionary theory of natural selection, the reason why scientists chose those theories is not because they had 100% 
factual truth right in front of their faces. It's not like that. What they did was, given the evidences that they saw, they were able to extrapolate, they were able to come up with the hypothesis that they guessed about what should happen then, what would be expected to happen. And then if they keep finding more and more evidences that match up with what should happen, what they should expect to happen from their guesswork, it confirms their hypothesis even more. That's why scientists stick to their scientific hypothesis for their technology, for everything. We all depend upon that because our life or death situation does depend upon that when you're driving a car in the middle of the freeway that fast. Think about that. People are betting their lives on that one. Based on what? That kind of logic. That logic of adductive schema inference to the best explanation. Wouldn't you do that with the eternity of your soul if the God hypothesis is true? People aren't going to argue possibilities around it. That's not scientific until you can come up with it. With evidences that uh, affirm your hypothesis, then let's talk about it. But till then, that's not the way, that's not practical everyday living. So in other words, if you're an agnostic, that's not a practical, realistic, everyday way of living then. Well, I'm not sure if God exists or if he does exist, you know. I, no, that's not a way to live, all right? You don't do that with other scientific theories or hypotheses, do you? All right. Now, anyway, so we understand so far, all right? The use of such extrapolation and theoretical reasoning can make the method of inference to the best explanation uniquely useful in evaluating the explanatory power of competing worldviews of metaphysical hypotheses. Indeed, though metaphysical hypotheses about the prime or ultimate reality often do not allow direct observation of the entities they postulate producing special effects, specific effects, excuse me, such hypotheses typically do posit, albeit unobservable, entities or past states with specific properties that should, if real, given us reason to expect specific observable, observable effects as we shall see. Then he comes after explaining everything about abductive inference. So there's no doubt, okay? He's a philosopher and science major in Cambridge. This, so he knows what he's talking about. His job is to examine, to critique the scientific theories itself, to build it up even more. Philosophers and science major in that. So not only do they have to know the scientific theories, they're supposed to critique its foundations, its methods. So he knows what he's talking about right here. And uh, Michael Shermer, who I believe is atheist, not agnostic, and the other uh, scientists, they don't deny his statements here. This is, this is actually practiced among scientists, okay? Abductive inferences. So, then he takes Bayesian probability calculus, which you learned in last discipleship. So I'm not going to read everything right here because I explained it to you. But remember how he is able to translate this into Bayesian probability calculus is as follows. I've given you the page numbers in last discipleship class. But just go to page 231 in uh, the return of the God hypothesis. By the way, it's in our library if you want to read that. Okay, so it's, we have all kinds of great books there. Okay, all right. So uh, you're going to get that book right now? Okay, so anyway... <laughs> Hey, he's smart, that guy. Okay. <laughs> so in Bayesian probability calculus, page 231, all right? And then onward to the end of uh, that section, uh, we'll, ex we'll explain what I'm explaining here, okay? But I'm just trying to give you the short version. Now, let's review. You remember, okay, how this works. So he translates into Bayesian probability calculus that uses abductive schema. So he first starts out with Bayesian probability calculus. So let's put this as BPC. That's not the correct abbreviation, but I'm just putting my own terms there. In Bayesian probability calculus, he's, he starts out with likelihoods. So in life, we go by things that are likely, right? Even detectives, they'll have to go by what is most likely. Scientists do that. So in likelihoods, it's translated to P and then right here, right here. The idea is th it's a conditional probability that is, estimates how much we 
ought to expect a given piece of evidence. So this is evidence, E. Given, uh, let's see right here. I just want to read this accurately. Given a uh, piece of evidence, if a specific hypothesis were true. Hypothesis, okay? And this is probability, all right? Evident, hypothesis, probability. How much we ought, so this translates to how much we ought to expect a given piece of evidence if a specific hypothesis were true. This is not made up by me, okay? This is something that is uh, condoned, this is recognized by scientists. All right, now continuing on, now we come to comparing likelihoods. See that, how it's building up the likelihood even more, making it stronger, stronger? You might as well say factual, but you know, it would be unscientific to say so, all right? So let's just not do that. So probability, now look at this. The ev evidence given the specific hypothesis were true, greater than the other one of a evidence given the specific hypothesis were true. So see that? The idea is hypothesis A is now, which is this one, is now competing against another hypothesis, B. We follow so far, right? So now we got to compare, all right, which one's stronger. Now it builds up even more so, okay? It builds up even more so with number three. Number three is what they call posterior probability. All right, the idea is this. You go with the probability. What's the idea here? He says, the posterior probability expresses the probability of the truth of a hypothesis after the fact of actually observing some evidence. So then he, that's the reason why he writes it as the probability of H given E. So he switches it now. You see that? Because he's trying to build it up more. He switches it, which is P hypothesis A uh, with the evidence. Knowing this conditional probability helps us decide how confident we should be in a hypothesis given the presence of some evidence. So the idea is we can now be more dependent, we can now believe more, have faith, see that? There's nothing wrong with having faith, okay? Even scientists have faith, all right? Otherwise they wouldn't be driving the car as fast as they would right now. So everyone has faith in something. Why? They have faith in their hypothesis given the evidence now. See that? But what we do is that posterior conditional probabilities also allow us to express the relative probability of one hypothesis compared to another. So it builds up even more if this, okay, so remember this hypothesis shows how strong, how much faith you can have, right? You have so much faith in this because of the evidence. But if this is weaker than this guy, then this means this hypothesis, you can believe even more so than that one. In other words, you can have more faith in this one than this one. So picture this. If this hypothesis is a universe where it naturally did it by itself, necessity, right? If that's the hypothesis, and this hypothesis is intelligent design, and there have been everyday experiences, evidences, that prove intelligent design, right? The watch that you have, the building that you're in, even though you never saw those creators. Same thing with this, with the universe, by necessity, right? Things can happen by itself, that's very true. If you see a car filled with dust, you know, the, the dust could have happened by itself out of necessity, because that's how it works, given the evidences of our everyday experience. But the thing is, now we're gonna compare, if this one is much stronger than this one, then that means this is easier faith than this one. 
Does that make any sense? So that's how he comes up with the third one. We are using the third one to prove the existence of God. That out of everything that I'm teaching you, this is the only thing that you would need to know. All right? This is the thing you need to know to prove God exists. And when I say proved, atheists don't throw a fit. All right? I mean how every, everybody else would use proved. How everyone else would use faith about a car existing and you're driving a car and stuff like that, okay? That the car would work, etc. But anyway, uh, the idea is this is how we argue for the existence of God. So what I would encourage Bible believers when they want to argue for the existence of God, they use Dr. Ruckman's as a foundation where he mentioned four causes to how our universe existed, the origins, right? Supernaturally, not it happened by itself because it always existed, or it's an illusion, or it just purely came from nothing, all right? It just happened. Is to take these four and to instead of saying 100% matter-of-fact truth, instead to use it as a scientific hypothesis. To argue it's a scientific method. And what's that called? Remember, inference to the best explanation. That's how, what I would strongly suggest to you to use that way, all right? With a person or an atheist who doesn't know any better, and there's plenty of them, there's like 80% of them that I talk to, you can use Dr. Upman's method, all right? Yeah. It works all the time, pretty much. But this is inference to the best explanation. If you want mathematical evidence of that, say Bayesian probability calculus. You might go, what's that? <laughs> all right. Now we understand so far how this works with Bayesian probability calculus. It's posterior probability, where we use uh, Bayesian probability calculus, which is extremely helpful. Now, uh, let's go uh, compare the competing hypotheses, okay? So now let's put these things to the test and compare them with other scientific evidences. Okay, we will compare them with a new chart as we continue on. I don't know if they can do it like this. Okay, I can do it like this, that way people can see for themselves. Now remember, the cause of our universe, right? You saw that picture, that chart, right? The causes to our universe. Let's compare them, and then now let's use inference to the best explanation given the evidences. All right, out of necessity, all right? It just had to happen by itself because of the laws of science, right? Uh, scientific laws, law of gravity, for example. And there's a lot of other laws that they will bet upon, and that's the reason why the universe had to exist, out of necessity. They use quantum mechanics. They use all this kind of language and jargon. They also mention chance. Because given enough time, then things will happen by itself. Okay, now there are problems with this argument, and these two is based off of materialism. Remember that, so M. So we're going to compete M against theism, which is another word for intelligent design, okay? So let's compare these arguments. Remember, it won't work no matter uh, how, many, how much randomness you put into it. If you add more time, that's even worse. Why is that? Because of Dembski's specification. In other words, if, you, if things become more complicated, then it shows more of intelligent design, not that it happened by itself. Another thing is, it's unnatural. That was admitted by the scientists who study, uh, I think they call it prebiotic selection or something like that, all these terms, where things, uh, the laws of science and DNA and life, it just had to happen by itself. No, it's unnatural. It's unnatural. It's not a natural way of doing things. When you call it chance, what does that mean? It's not normal. See that? It's not a normal routine of doing things. It's not the natural way of doing things. It's going the opposite of it. It's unnatural. Aren't they called naturalists? 
that things naturally happen by itself? Well, when you look at things that naturally happen by itself, it's unnatural where you're going to get a complicated DNA like that. All right? That's what you discover when you study things naturally. So we've argued about that one. Out of necessity, the laws of science, or they'll combine the two together, out of necessity. Uh, one of their famous examples was the, I think they call it primeval atom or something like that. Or they'll say dark matter and other language like that. Or gravity and stuff like that. The problem with that, as I told you before, is that singularity theorem. The singularity theorem pointed out that all matter and energy in our universe had a beginning. And at a point where there is zero time, zero space. The professor, uh, Professor Meyer, asked the students one time, how much stuff can you put in no space? Nothing. So how can you order, argue for gravity or dark matter or these elements that created our universe when you can't put them in no space? So that's the singularity theorem. Remember we talked about that? So it can't just happen by itself. Something transcendent outside of that had to put it into there. You have to do that. Uh, they'll argue quantum mechanics and they'll criticize yours truly about you don't know the difference with classical gravity, quantum gravity. Well, anyway, I'll explain that more in our next discipleship lesson because I don't have time for that. And by the way, that's the only intelligent comment that I'll give credence to because everything else is so unintelligent. They, they say stuff like, uh, I don't need to watch this whole video to know that it's wrong. I know why, because you got lost at Bayesian probability calculus, that's why, you know. But uh, these, uh, that's the only intelligent comment that I found, but even that comment by itself shows that they don't know too much themselves. Because they never read, I think it was Quanta magazine or something like that, they major in scientific stuff like that, or quantum mechanics. But there are scientists out there, or physicists who argue that uh, there may not be such a thing as quantum gravity. They may be more interrelated than you think. But I'll cover that one later on, all right? That one's just a theory, because every scientist has a theory, all right? So, but anyway, the point is, is that even though they're criticizing yours truly about that one, the problem is this. The problem is, as I have showed you in those uh, page numbers before, that with that, you need an infinitely, infinitely hot, dense, density of matter with its corresponding gravity. So then how can you do that in no space? That's the problem. How can you do that at a point of singularity, of nothing? You cannot do that. That's why they'll argue, not by normal or classical gravity, that they want to, quant uh, I'll just use the amateurish term, my own term, quantitize everything. In other words, any matter, energy, gravity, or forces of nature, they want to quantitize it even more, minimize it even more, to prove that, hey, it can happen by itself. But even those things are what you're going to find out very abstract. Scientists will admit when you get into quantum mechanics or especially referring to the creation or the existence of our universe, it's so abstract. It's so abstract, it's so relative and that you can conjure up many different possibilities yourself. Like I've given you the example about the case of uh, things that interact with each other. Those are scientific laws, right? Based on certain conditions. Remember that? And then I've given you an example, person A murdered person B. So person A took out a knife, stabbed person B. Hence, murder is what caused it to happen. No, murder is just a description of that interaction of those two things, right? That doesn't necessarily explain the cause. You, your job is to find the cause, not just describe what happened. I know that murder happened, right? But I want to know exactly what entailed, what caused it. Was, was there malice, malicious intent involved? Was it by accident? Are there evidences to confirm that hypothesis? See that? That's what you're supposed to do. Not just describe things. Scientific laws, quantum mechanics, remember, they describe interaction of things. That's the amateurish version of it. Mathematics describes things as well. Like I told you before, mathematics don't prove the cause of the universe. I could say that there's uh, 100 people in this room, 10 people walked out of the door after I preached a negative sermon, so math caused it to happen, the people to walk out. No, math is just a description where you translate those certain incidents into numbers. 
That's just a description. It didn't cause it to happen. You have to find the cause. Maybe there's something negative in my sermon that offended the people, right? But you notice how you can use now mathematical numbers and laws to come up with anything abstract. There's a lot of freedom or possibilities that you can use to come up with your own theories. See that? I can take the mathematics example. I can take the example about the murder of those two people. I can put pretty much whatever I want if I put the right conditions in there. Right? But that's not going to prove the actual cause of the murder or the actual cause of that mathematical incident where people left my room after the preach in. That will show more intelligent design. But that's a whole other story, all right? But I'll get into that later. Long story short is that necessity won't do it. Won't do it as we described it. But notice how intelligent design seems to follow all these things all the time and seems to be the better hypothesis all the time. You notice that? When I talked about necessity, I mentioned about intelligent design where certain conditions are placed. As a matter of fact, it, they have to restrict things when they do their equations and stuff like that. Okay, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll explain all that to you later on when we cover quantum mechanics, quantum gravity, and quantum this, quantum that, Stephen Hawking stuff. Point is, is that we're comparing the hypothesis and you understand how inference to the best explanation works. You notice what we're doing. We're using, long story short in all of this, see we're using evidences, see that? We're using evidences to see which hypothesis works, which hypothesis doesn't work. And at the same time, we're comparing the hypothesis in which ones are better given the evidences. See that? So that's what we did so far. The other one is pantheism, all right? Why? Because there might be something spiritual or divine in nature, as some Eastern religious people would believe. So the universe had always existed in a sense. A cycle of reincarnation was involved, stuff like that. Now, that's just one form of it. There are many people who have different beliefs of uh, Eastern religions, Hinduism, reincarnation, and pantheism. But the point is, that's not going to work because the reason why is that pantheism depends on that universe itself, right? And then scientifically, we discovered the universe had a beginning. So that's not going to work with singularity. The other one is uh, panspermia. I think that's the word. Panspermia, in other words, how do you not know there's intelligent life out there and then aliens made it happen? Yeah. Now, they're not really trying to say it, but the way Dawkins, Krauss, and Neil deGrasse Tyson are kind of indicating, they're trying to indicate to you that there might be extra intelligence agents out there that helped with our evolutionary process. So you would think that this is so ridiculous, but it's amazing how respected scientists today would go into la-la land for that one. All right, this is really funny, isn't it? Yeah. And you know what the funny thing about it is? They're still, though, I don't care what you call those extra intelligent agencies or whatever they are. The point is they're all still involved with the universe itself. They're all still involved with the process of the universe itself. And remember, the universe had a beginning. So you're not going to get around that one. Unless you want to say God, see, outside of the material natural universe, something that transcends that, but aliens cannot do that. Until you get to that point, then let's talk about it, all right? But see, they don't want to say God or gods or basically theism, polytheism. They just don't want to go there. See, that's the problem with them. So panspermia is not going to work. And then the other one is deism. Why won't that work? Deism, just like theistic evolutionists. In other words, these people will believe that God did use evolution to create our universe. So there is a God because the fine-tuning of the universe is so hard to explain. Well, the easy debunking to that one is if God started with that Big Bang and then billions of years, he just left it alone and let science work itself out to create what we are today, then what are you going to do about DNA? That, that don't happen by itself. Just like I told you before, four letters. Remember I just covered four letters in a certain DNA? 
these four letters, let's say we have a whole bunch of letters, and I want four letters to spell out, um, let's see right here, well, I'm going to think about four letters, dogs, okay? Dogs. If I take a whole bunch of letters, scatter it, uh, and they're all magnets, and then I place it on a magnetic board, each letter is magnetically attracted to each other, right? D is not going to be attracted to only O, and O won't be specifically attracted to G, and G will not be specifically attracted to S to create dogs. It's each letter is going to be magnetically attracted to any other letter, right? Okay, that's the problem with DNA, remember, because all these things in DNA, which you can translate into letters, are all magnetically attracted to each other. In other words, DNA, if you were to spell out everything in a DNA through letters, it will turn into a complicated encyclopedia. And I'm not joking, all right? That's, a, that's being very lenient, all right? It's much more than encyclopedia. It's volumes of encyclopedia, where each letter is not just a word, but communicates a whole message. That's how complicated DNA is when they translate these things or code these things into letters. Okay, the problem is each letter in the DNA is magnetically attracted to each other. It's not naturally by itself attracted to create a certain message or the right letter next to each other. So what are you going to do with billions of cells in your body? If you argue necessity, the laws of science is what created uh, our human self, our DNA. No, the laws of science make it worse. Why? Because the laws of science argue that each letter is equally magnetically attracted to each other. That makes it worse. <laughs> so what is it then? Somebody or something deliberately put it into place. So deism is going to be out the window. So I covered DNA with just its four letters last time, okay? So I'm not going to expound that one again. But you notice right here now, then what's the best explanation? Intelligent design. Oh, you say it's God, so then they'll argue God of the gaps. I'll stop here, okay. All right, so they're going to argue God of the gaps. Oh, you just insert God there because it's just a convenient explanation. No, it's based off of actual everyday experiences that we have. That's empiricism. Just like any other thing, all right? Some of these things are way off anyway, all right? So, but based off of everyday experiences that built up into what is called God. And we will cover those things and debunk the God of the gaps argument. And we, how did we come up with transcendent, right? Because it has to be beyond that due to the singularity point. Something outside of the natural realm and then something that transcends it. Aliens, God, whatever, I don't care, but the point is it's transcendent. And then another one is that it, there's intelligence involved because of complicated information. And then also free agent, free will. Like the pri primeval Adam, it can't just sit doing nothing for eternity and all of a sudden evolve. That doesn't make sense, right? That's how scientists are trying to do it. But if you put free agent there, that changes something. Because why? A free agent or a free thinking mind, what he can do is cause a sudden change. A sudden change out of that, what is normal. So notice transcendent, it's intelligent, it's free agent, and also extremely powerful. That is immaterial as well. So then, that's why we, why not call it God then, all right? That, that pretty much sums God, right? That's how we come up with that. But I'll explain that in our next discipleship class. We'll debunk the God of the gaps argument, and then I'm going to critique Stephen Hawking's uh, gravity itself, quantum gravity. Uh, Sean Carroll used Schrodinger's cat and all that kind of stuff. Wheeler DeWitt equation. And then that's, uh, I think, the C, the Greek C symbol, you know, where you can use as a universal wave function. I'll cover all that complicated stuff, all right? So it'll be a lot of fun, actually. I'll translate it to basic English, all right? 
but it'll be a lot of fun, and we'll debunk that why that doesn't work. You'll be surprised how, how much simpler it is than you think, okay? It will piggyback pretty much what I already argued for you concerning about laws only describe things. They don't cause things to happen. Math only describes things. Math don't cause things to happen. Certain conditions are placed, that are, and those conditions are fine-tuned themselves. Remember that? If you remember those arguments, you're going to see those three in that complicated equation and that mess that the devil created, and you'd realize how easy it is to debunk it after that. But it only becomes easy to debunk if you followed along the information so far and you're faithful, okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. Open our eyes more to Bible-believing truth and that you are real and that you are true. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.